come. And uh, we'll, we, have we got one of these up in there? Is this what we're saving this one for? Have we got one up? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. In the bulletin, the very top item, now listen closely. Tonight we begin the journey through Revelation. We've entitled it after our theme that we put up on the wall after this. We've just had our church anniversary, 17 years. God's been blessing us. And, uh, and so what, what happens after this? Does 17 years mean what we do what Brother Paul was talking about in Sunday school class uh, earlier? We just, is it time to retire? <laughs> do we retire as a church? We celebrated our retirement anniversary. No, I think God expects us to keep just moving on. After this, new heights I'm gaining every day. And so if we keep moving forward with the attitude that we want to reach more people and grow for the Lord, I believe he'll bless us for that. And so tonight we will, uh, we will begin the very first message. Why is the first message so important? Because we're going to set the framework for understanding the book of Revelation. If you talk to ten different people about the interpretation of the book of Revelation, you probably get ten different answers about what it means. Somebody says, well, I believe it means this. And somebody says, well, it means this to me. Well, it can't mean something different than what God said. I mean, we can believe whatever we want to, but what God said is what counts. And so if we, if we set the, the groundwork, we set up the framework where that everything will fit together within that framework as we study through the book of Revelation, then we'll understand it properly. And a lot of people say, well, I, I'm just afraid of the book of Revelation. I don't think anybody can understand it. Well, why would God write it if he didn't mean for us to understand it? <laughs> I think he wants us to understand it, and I believe we can. And uh, so tonight is a very important message, laying the framework, foundation, and putting up the framework for understanding Revelation. So I hope you're here at 6 o'clock tonight, and then every Sunday evening we'll continue through the book of Revelation. We'll probably be on it for close to a year, and so I hope you don't miss out on any of it. Uh, we need the Word of God. And uh, even though it is prophecy, there's a lot of application in it for us right now, today. In fact, I'll show you tonight how some of it applies to us already. I mean, in, in last week's news and in tomorrow's news. And so I hope you're here tonight as we look into the book of Revelation. And then uh, we're going to begin a, an aggressive outreach campaign this week. Now, I hope you're inviting people all week long, but on Thursday night, I'm asking you to do something that you might normally not do. Join us on Thursday night at 6 o'clock, and we're going to go out together as a group, and we're going to take these, these posters uh, like that, and we're going to hand these out to people and put them on people's doors and, and talk to people, and we're going to try to cover as much ground. We won't, we won't spend a lot of time at any one place, just hand them a... Uh, hand them a poster and invite them to church and tell them what's going on. You say, well, I think if I, if I run across somebody that's ready to get saved, should I witness to them? No, just let them go to hell. <laughs> no, I'm serious. If somebody is a Philippian jailer and they're ready to get saved, stop and lead them to the Lord. <laughs> uh, but uh, our point, our main thrust is going to be is getting the invitations in as many people's hands as possible inviting as many boys and girls and moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas as possible. So uh, join us on two, two times we're going to go out as a group. Thursday night when? Six o'clock. Two people know that already. <laughs> Let's say it together. You ready? Six o'clock. Okay, you got it. Then on Saturday morning we're going out at 10 o'clock. And so we'll meet here at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. We'll go out and hand these things out. And uh, we won't stay out a long time because if we go out and really uh, put the shoe leather to the sidewalk, we'll cover a lot of ground in just an hour, hour and a half's time. We can cover a lot of time. Now, uh, we'll probably stay out to about noon on, on Saturday and longer if you want to. So, uh, but I'm just asking you to commit at least an hour and a half, two times this week to get the word out because this room is normally filled. We're, we're, a, little bit, we're a little bit low on, uh, on kids here today. And so... There's two ways to look at that. Number one, we could say, well, kids don't want to come to church, and so we'll just have to uh, forget about it. 
Well, you can look at it that way, or you could look at it as we've got Dunlop coming next week, and he's going to be the one to draw kids in and build up our children's ministries. You know, if you get kids in, you generally get moms and dads in behind them, and so we want to attract those. Uh, let's see. We go uh, Sunday morning next week. Brother Dunlop will be teaching the adult Sunday school class, so we'll, we'll bring all the adults in here. Uh, except for the Sunday school teachers on Sunday morning and then during the morning service then he'll be preaching to the whole crowd and then that night uh, we'll be we'll be in full swing everything both barrels unloaded at once going full blast ahead October 31st we have a fall festival at the pastor's home at six o'clock and we'll have time around the campfire hay rides and stuff like that fun and games and we'll have a good time that'll be on a uh, that's a is that a Friday night Thursday, I mean Friday night, uh, October the 31st. Okay, and then November the 2nd, daylight saving time ends. Everybody said, hooray. And now I don't have to get up before daylight anymore. Uh, some of you. Brother, Dan Brother, Brother Danny gets up before daylight regardless of what the time is, don't you? <laughs> he drives for Walmart, and he gets up about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And so pray for him. Nobody ought to have to get up at that time of morning. <laughs> And then November 9th, we'll be honoring veterans in the morning service. Uh, we've got Stanley Rogers, an evangelist, going to be with us. He and his family will be uh, parking their RV here uh, on November the 8th and staying for a few days. They, he has a, a revival meeting over close to Fort Smith, and he called and asked if he could park on the parking lot uh, for a couple of days till he goes to his next meeting. And so since they're going to be here on uh, Sunday morning and Sunday night, I, I went ahead and asked him to uh, teach the adult Sunday school class that morning, Brother Paul. Uh, on the 9th of November uh, and then he'll be preaching the evening service and his family sings there's 10 of them in the family uh, they got a bunch of kids now the rest of you better get busy <laughs> that's the way to grow a church <laughs> he's got his own church with him he just hauls them around in that RV but his family sings and uh, they sing good old country down home type singing so if you like that kind of music you'll enjoy uh, that we'll have them sing that morning and that night and so mark that on your calendar and don't miss it November uh, the 9th and then uh, that's the evening that we have our Thanksgiving potluck meal so we're going to be eating ham and turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy and biscuits and all that other stuff pumpkin pies hey, if anybody needs some pumpkin really we got we got some big cans of pumpkin in our food uh, pantry back there that needs to be rotated out anyway it's still good but we got some big cans, you know, I don't know how much it is, close to a gallon, I guess. And uh, so if you want one of those to make some pumpkin pies, whether it's for church or just for yourself, let me know after church and we'll show you where it's at. Or get with my wife, she knows where it's at. And, then, and we've got some other stuff like strawberry glaze and some stuff like that back there too that needs to go on out. And if you want to, you, you know, a couple of you ladies say, I can't cook that much pumpkin pie or use that much strawberry glaze. Well, get together and share, share it between two or three people. All right, uh, let's see. Anything else I was supposed to say that I left out? <clears throat> Under Revelation? Uh, oh, the prayer meeting. Yeah, okay. I'm glad you did mention that. There will be a, a, a prayer meeting uh, each evening which where, where is that on there I'm, not, I'm missing it I guess it's the one. under this week okay there it is I see yeah I did skip that I'm sorry uh, join us each evening this week at 6 p.m. for a time of prayer over the crusade each evening at 6 o'clock here at the church if you can come any one particular night will join us and we'll be praying for the crusade all right anything else I missed all right who's singing for us you are Ms. Erica is going to sing, and then the message.
which was lost has been found. Grace is like the Father. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Thank you, Miss Erica, for that wonderful song. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. You didn't let a keep, an old rainy, dreary day keep you away. Thank, thank God. You know, there's some people just looking for a reason not to go to church, and, uh, and you found reason to come, and so praise the Lord for you being here today. We never take it lightly that, that anybody has uh, chosen to join in the Lord's services here at Liberty Baptist and we want you to know we certainly appreciate you being here today. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And just one more time, I really, really want to encourage you to be here tonight for the beginning of the Revelation messages. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, let's begin reading in verse number 16, and we'll read three verses there. 16 through the end of the chapter. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not. Underline those words if you mark in your Bible. We faint not. By the way, I do mark in my Bible. See this old Bible here? This is an old Bible. It's, it's coming apart. It's leather but it's, it's about seen its best days. But I won that back in uh, about 1980 or 81 uh, for inviting people to a revival meeting. I'd just gotten saved, and I was dumb enough to think everybody would come if I invited them. And you know what? A bunch of them did. <laughs> a bunch of them came, and I won the Bible. And, uh, and ever since, I've been marking in it. I, you can't see the marks from where you are, but I'm marking this Bible. I've got a dozen different Bibles. I, I guess this one would have perished a long time ago if I hadn't... Uh, uh, kind of laid it on the shelf for periods of time where it didn't get used as much. But I like to make notes in my Bible. If I don't mark in my Bible, I'd certainly make notes on a piece of paper because God gives you thoughts when you're under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God or when you're reading the Word of God. And uh, you're more likely to remember what the, God, what the Lord has impressed you with if you write it down. And so if God gives you a good thought, jot it down. A lot of times people say, well, preacher, you didn't say anything that... Uh, that I thought was worth writing down, but God reminded me of something else while you was preaching, so that's all right, too. If God reminds you of something special, jot it down. Well, let's read on. He says, For which cause we faint not, but through, uh, though, I'm sorry, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh, now underline the word worketh, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For 
it says in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. There's some things going on in your life that are easily seen, but there's some things that the Lord is doing that's not seen. And you can see those things. In fact, the writer of Hebrews said, said that, that he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How do you see something that's invisible? Spiritually. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. Underline that word, temporal. Temporal means temporary. It's just there for a while. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. They are not temporal. They don't vanish away. The eternal things last. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would bless us. And Lord, I pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, you know, and I know, that nothing much is going to happen around here if you don't get involved in this service and that if your Holy Spirit does not take the words from your own word and apply them in our lives. And Lord, that's what we ask for. Lord, they talked about in Sunday school class, those who are able to hear and those who are not. And Lord, I pray that you'd make our ears, our spiritual ears, able to hear this morning. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I was having a good time one day fishing in the pond. I used to go down the pond bank. I'd catch some pretty big bass every once in a while. But this day, fish weren't biting, and I was throwing my lure out. I had a lazy Ike. Anybody remember a lazy Ike? Yeah, those things are good. And uh, I'd throw that lazy Ike out there, and I'd retrieve it, and nothing was biting. And uh, I got to watch it, and there, I saw a ripple going across the water, and there was a cottonmouth snake. He was swimming across the pond. You know how they do like this? And, and I thought, uh, well, since fish not biting, I'll just uh, I'll try the snake. And so I cast out there and, and uh, tried to snag him, missed him, reeled it back in. So he's still making his way across the pond. He doesn't know that he's being stalked. And so I threw it out there again and got a little closer and snagged and missed him again. And uh, as, as he made his way across the pond, about the third or fourth time that I cast out, I threw it right across his back. And when I gave that thing a snag, man, I caught him. Whoo, you talk about a hallelujah time. Now that'd make you pull your shoes off and run you get a that's like the biggest fish you ever caught I mean that thing's cutting a shine boy he's going flopping up out of the water and I'm having a great time I think boy it's the most fun I've ever had catching anything and I'm reeling him in and boy he's fighting and we're having a great time and then I get him right up to the bank and it dawns on me now what do I do I've got a snake on my lazy Ike and I don't know what to do <laughs> I mean I my joy suddenly turned to a dumb look. And then I was discouraged. I thought, man, I don't want to, you know what I finally done? I had to cut, take my pocket knife out and cut my lazy eye loose and let the snake have it. You know, I was kind of discouraged and lost heart about fishing that day. It just kind of took all the wind out of my sails. I wasn't interested in fishing anymore. I lost my lazy eye. Not a happy time. Now, did anybody here come today? hoping that when you came to church this morning, you walked through the doors thinking, boy, I hope somebody can discourage me today. I hope some of the singing will really turn me off and make me bitter today. I really hope that the Sunday school teacher will teach something that can discourage me today. I hope that preacher can, can preach a message that will make me mad and discouraged and, uh, and just cause me to lose heart. That's what I want today. Did anybody come thinking that? Uh, they, if you did, you, we've got a place for you. <laughs> They've got little men in white coats come and get you. <laughs> and here he is right on the front row. <laughs> nobody, nobody comes expecting that, do they? Why do we come? We don't come saying, Hey, Pastor, please hurt me today. Preach something that will really nag or irritate or drag me down. I want to I wanna faint. I want to lose heart today. I don't think anybody comes here looking for that. I think they come looking for the opposite, don't you? Come looking for something to encourage them, a desire to be motivated to do more 
and better things, a way to come up and out of the miry clay and get our feet on a solid rock. In a world that's filled with so much hopelessness, I mean, you've got Ebola that's uh, spreading throughout the world. You've got a Supreme Court that's gone wacky and making stupid decisions. We've got a culture that thinks everything is upside down to what it ought to be. And, uh, and we say, boy, did that prophecy ever come true that Jesus said there will come a time when they call wrong right and right wrong? And I think we're there. And, and boy, doesn't that discourage you if you let it? You think about everything that's going haywire in our nation. I mean, our political system, our economics, and everything. You just look around you. Uh, I mean, everything seems to be offering something to discourage you. And so... I don't think we come expecting that something else will be done or said to discourage us more. We've got plenty of that out there already. And in this passage of Scripture, in our verse, it says, For the which cause, verse 16, For the which cause we faint not. What does that mean? We faint not. The word, the word means to apply to the heart being discouraged. And so the, here's, what the, here's what the phrase means. If we were saying it in Arkansas language today, we might say, don't lose heart. And that's what we're going to title the message today. Don't lose heart. Faint not. Paul said, for which cause we faint not. And so you probably had times. Maybe you're going through a time right now where you're, you're kind of like the, the campfire that used to have some coals and wood and blaze going up and some five-gallon bucket of water on you. That's what it means to faint, to be discouraged and to lose heart. But Paul said, for the which cause we faint not and we don't lose heart. And nobody goes anywhere and does anything for the specific purpose of losing heart, but it happens. And I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about today. I'll give you three points out of this passage of Scripture that I believe will have a great deal of effect on your life if you have ears to hear and you're determined not to lose heart. The first thing I want you to see is an incredible statement. In verse 16, he says, For the which cause... We faint not, or we don't have a failing of our heart. We're not talking about the, the physical heart, although I don't want my physical heart to fail, uh, but our seat of emotions, our attitude, our will, our desire. We don't want it to fail, do we? We don't. We don't want to lose heart. seems to me that this phrase that the Apostle Paul is using here is in the present tense right now he's not saying we didn't lose heart in the past but he's saying we faint not or we don't lose heart right now we're in a present state of mind where we don't lose heart second corinthians turn back over just a few pages to uh to verse number uh, chapter chapter one verse eight chapter one verse eight paul's paul's life you say well, if I was the Apostle Paul, I probably wouldn't lose heart either. I mean, he's, he's the great apostle. He's the one who planted all those churches. He was the, the great missionary. He had this special anointing from God, and so he probably wouldn't have a faint heart. He was special. Well, he was special in a lot of ways, but he was made out of the same dust that you and I are made out of. He had the same heart and same experiences that you and I can have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 8, he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. Oh, well, look at that. Our what? Trouble. Did the apostle Paul have trouble? He said so. Which came to us, us in Asia that were pressed out of measure. Oh, listen to that. Pressed out of measure. You ever felt that way? above strength in so much that we even despaired that we despaired even of life do you think his heart got affected did he become faint 
There were times in his life when things happened to him just like happened to you and me. Now, turn to chapter 11 and verse number 23. Same book. Chapter 11, verse 23. Paul's the one... You've got to understand, the reason I'm going to, to a great deal of, of detail on what Paul encountered was because he's the one that says in the present tense, we think not. He had had circumstances that made him, just like you and me, shaky. But it's important to notice that even though he came through those, look at, look at what he had been in uh, chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In laborers more abundant. You ever get tired of working? He said he labored. In stripes above measure. Ever been beaten? He had. In pre prisons more frequent. Ever been there? No, don't answer that. Uh, in deaths oft. He was threatened with death oftentimes. Of the Jews five, five times received I forty stripes save one. They said forty stripes was enough to kill a man. He said I came within one stripe of dying. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice, three times, I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. That means that, that he had to float around on a piece of wood out in the sea in the waves and the cold. He said, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils, in perils means danger, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. You ever have anybody to forsake you? Ever have anybody turn their back on you? Have you ever been rejected? Have you ever had somebody who you thought was a good friend who suddenly not a friend betrayed you? Hey, that happened to Jesus too. Remember a man by the name of Judas? Paul had it happen to him over and again. He said, in weariness and painfulness. You got any pains? Go through any aches, sickness, disease? Yeah. He did too. He said in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Hey, Paul said, in all of these things that have happened to me, I've experienced about as many bad things that can happen to a person. I've about experienced about as much of it as anybody could. I've had my problems. And then he's able to say just a few chapters over, I think not. I'm not going to faint. Well, is there anybody here who can say that they've been discouraged and wanted to give up? Say, I'm ashamed to admit it. Yeah, me too. I'm the big preacher. I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to be discouraged. I mean, you'd slap me. I don't care. I won't be discouraged. <laughs> Go ahead and drop out of church. It won't discourage me. Go ahead and and let your family go downhill and live for the devil. It won't bother me. But I'm the big preacher. You believe that for a minute? Neither do I. We all go through things like this. And none of us in this room, I don't think, can say, I've never, I've never been discouraged. Never had any of these problems in my life. Everything's... Everything's just roses all the way. Roses have thorns, and we've all gripped them a few times. Who has not said with the psalmist in Psalm 55, verse 6, Oh, that I had doves like a, uh, that I had wings like a dove, then would I fly away and be at rest. <laughs> have you ever wished that in the middle of the circumstances that you're in, whether it's physical, sickness, financial problems, family problems, no matter what it is, you, you've got problems and you say, boy, if I could just sprout wings and fly up above this, I'd get out of here. Sometimes I, I think, I get to thinking about some of my problems, I think, boy, I, 
this would be a good time for Jesus to come back and get caught up in the rapture, you know, and just flutter away into the sky and leave all that stuff behind. We've all said something like that, haven't we? Well, what's incredible about the statement that Paul made? He said, I think not. How could he say that? I, I don't lose heart because he had experienced these things. He wasn't immune to them. So how could he say that? L let me give you point number two, a familiar struggle. A very familiar struggle. He didn't, he wasn't immune to the problems that we all face. So is it just easy for some people not to lose heart? The reason it's so easy to lose heart, I still want to talk, I'm going to give you some good news before we get done with the message, okay? This is the old, this is the old salesman method. You've got, you got to make somebody feel the pain before they understand they need a cure. It's a, it's, a, it's a grand statement that he made, but it almost seems outlandish and incredible that anybody can say, I, I don't lose heart. But there's some reasons why we lose heart. And it's found in verse number 16. Look, look at verse number 16. Back in chapter number 4. It says, For the which cause we faint not, but though our... Look at that next phrase. Outward man perish. Our outward man perish. What's the outward man? You know that when we're saved, we, we, we are not just a physical being. Isn't that right? When we get born again, what gets born again? That dead spirit. We had a spirit in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve fell that was able to fellowship with God. But when man fell in the Garden of Eden, the spirit died. When, when God said, in the day that you partake of the fruit thereof, in that day you shall surely die, man died spiritually that day. And everybody since then, listen, everybody since then has been born with a dead spirit. That's why Jesus likened salvation to the new birth, being born again. That's when your spirit comes alive. So after your spirit comes alive, now you've got two parts. A live spirit and a live body. You may have questions about whether your body's live this morning. <laughs> well, that's what Paul is actually questioning here. The outward man is the body, the physical part of us. And he says, though our outward man perish. That's the fleshly part. And it encompasses both the body, listen, and the mind. The mind is not the spirit. The spirit comes from God, and it can only be made alive by God. But even before you're saved, you have a mind, and that's part of the outward man. Your outward man possesses a mind. And so that's why we can say that our outward man perishes. Our body, as we get older, what happens? We get a few wrinkles. Or if you don't have a few wrinkles, you've got too much fluff that f fills out the wrinkles. <laughs> the outward man perishes. But what else can happen to us as we age? Not just the body, but sometimes the mind. The mind grows dim. What's it doing? It's perishing. Anybody have trouble finding your keys? Anybody have trouble finding the remote to the TV? Anybody have uh, trouble remembering an appointment that you set? You set and you forgot to show up. You don't have that trouble, do you? <laughs> you bunch of liars. <laughs> Our outward man perishes, and it's not just the body, but it's the mind too. That's why people with Alzheimer's, their mind is perishing as the body perishes. Dementia causes us to lose heart. A perishing body can cause us to lose heart. Well, the outer man can perish and it can become something that drags us down. I get sometimes get a little aggravated at myself because I'm not able to do what I once could do. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
your breath a little bit shorter than it was when you were younger, you that are older, you that are younger better enjoy it while you can and do a lot of exercise. Maybe you can prolong this, but it won't keep it from coming. <laughs> it will come sooner or later. I get a little aggravated at myself because my body won't do what it used to do. I mean, I watch those guys playing in the, in, in the playoffs for the World Series and watch those guys come running across the field. There's a, there's a fly ball coming, and that guy comes running across there, and he dives and catches the ball and then slides on the ground and raises up the ball that he caught. If I was to do that, it would be a splat, <laughs> just a wet spot on the ground. <laughs> body is not what it used to be and because of a deteriorating body it can be a discouragement ladies can lose their beauty men can lose the virility a lot of things happen to us we're not able to do as much this year as we could last year and our outward man begins to perish Romans chapter 8 verse 22 uh, it, it happens to everything it's called in science they call it the law of sec, the second law of thermodynamics everything is deteriorating everything is running down you know when the old fashioned alarm clock when you wind the alarm clock and that, you get that spring wound up real tight and it's tick 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 but then as it runs down just before it quits it's going tick tick some of you are there now aren't you <laughs> and tick 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 and it's dead that's the scientific law of thermodynamics that everything is going from an orderly state to a less orderly state. And that's happening to our bodies. It's happening to our world. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our what our body we get into the we'll get into the rapture in the book of revelation uh, tonight and in the days to come and we're going to talk about that first resurrection when the rapture happens and believers will be caught up and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 it talks about that catching up and the fact that we're going to be given a brand new body at that time then you'll be young and handsome or beautiful more than ever before, but that day has not come yet. And so for now, we have to be understanding that we're going downhill and as the whole creation is. You see, the Bible says, listen to this verse. The Bible says, and even young people, young people need to heed this. Here's what the Bible says. Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment it's appointed for us to die you can live as healthy as you want to and you can eat as healthy as you want to and you can exercise as much as you want to and there's a good chance it'll probably help you to live longer but sooner or later your body's going to wear out I don't know anybody that was alive 200 years ago do you what about 150? What about 125? There may be, in that area, there may be somebody in the world that's living a little over 100 years, but nobody's making it to 200 anymore. Why? Because our body is running down and it's causing us to wear away. The outer man is perishing. The Bible calls it in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're made out of dirt, and we're going back to the dirt. So, what causes us to be faint-hearted can be discouraging. The fallen nature, and number two, fallen men. You can be discouraged, you can lose heart because of what's happening in your own body, but then there's people that are outside your body that's going to also be able to discourage you and cause you to faint, lose heart. I read the little, uh, about the little cartoon uh, back when, uh, was, it, uh, was it Charles Schultz that had the, was his name Charles that used to write the uh, Snoopy cartoons? Uh, there was, Snoopy was out 
is in the winter time and Snoopy's out on the uh, ice and he's skating around with, in his bare feet and man he's just sliding here and there and, and he's just having a wonderful little time you know uh, skating with all the other people on the ice and then Lucy comes up and she's got her skates on and she skates up in front of Snoopy and she says what do you think you're doing he said, well, I'm skating. She said, you're not skating. You don't even have skates on. He's just looking at her. She said, you can't be skating. That's not called skating. It's not possible, not any ways possible that that's skating. You don't have skates. You're not skating. All you're doing is just sliding around. And he's standing there staring at her. Finally, he mopes off and says to himself, he said, man, and I thought I was having a good time, so she came along. There are people, there's Lucy's in your life that will cause you to be faint-hearted who have the power, if you let them, to discourage you. Now, you can't get mixed up about this because sometimes the people who you think are discouraging you, they may be discouraging you only in your mind because they're telling you maybe something that's truth and you're resisting the truth and you feel discouraged because you're in rebellion. saying a preacher that's not what I wanted to hear we're good at hearing what we want to hear and sometimes we can hear things that's good for us and reject it and sometimes on the other hand there's somebody who just sets out there are negative people in the world know any of them there's people that it doesn't matter you can say man I am glad to be alive today and they say well, I don't know what you've got to be happy about Whoa, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> There's people that will make you faint-hearted. The foolishness of fallen man causes him to become faint-hearted and to make other people faint-hearted. Hey, if, you, if you want to be real negative, do it to somebody else. Don't do it to me. <laughs> I have enough battles trying to stay encouraged without having to battle somebody else's negativity if uh, you know mama used to have a saying if you can't say something good just don't say it now oftentimes we get around people who are just looking for some way to say something doesn't matter what you see that's good they'll find a way to tear it down they'll throw a bucket of cold water on your campfire that was in Paul's experience. He said in chapter 12, or four, chapter 4, verse 12 of this book that we're reading now, he said, So then death worketh in us. We all have death working in us. Let me give you the third one and I'll be done. We have an incredible statement. That is, Paul said, I don't lose heart. And then secondly, we see a familiar struggle, something we all go through and because of our fallen nature and because of other fallen people we have a battle with discouragement and fainting but let, let me give you number three this is the good this is the good one a wonderful secret verses 17 and 18 he says for our light affliction which is but for a what moment and he calls it a light affliction underline the word light you say my problems don't feel so light and that word moment, you say, it doesn't seem like a moment to me. It seems like an eternity. But Paul's been through those things, remember? Do you think when he laid out in the, floating on a piece of a board out in the sea for three days and three nights with the, with the fish nipping at his toes, that he was out there saying, boy, I'm enjoying this. I've been wanting to swim for a long time like this. No, it probably seemed like an eternity laying out there floating, waiting to be rescued. But yet he's the one that says it's light and it's but for a moment. And he says, though our outward man perish, I faint not, we faint not. Now, what is this wonderful secret? Let's read on down. He says in the middle of that verse, he says that worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What, what's doing that? 
He said the things, listen, the things that's happening in our lives that we think are heavy and are a, a never-ending night, he says those things are working for glory in you. Now, that's hard to grasp. But that's what it says. That's what Paul is trying to get across to us. Then look at verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen. Uh-oh, right there. You know what a lot of people's problem is? Look at me. A lot of people's problem is that they're looking at the things which are seen. When you look at a hurt, when you look at a disappointment, when you look at something that is discouraging and you won't let it go and you decide to sit home and brood about it and, and, and roll it over and over in your mind, you're looking at that thing which is happening in your life that can be seen. You know all that's going to do? That's like setting a bunch of eggs and putting a hen on it and they're going to hatch sooner or later. When you think about your problems and all you want to do is, is sit and, and the worst thing you can do usually is to just sit alone and brood about what all has happened to you and what is happening. Hey, I know there's people sitting in this room. We've had multitudes uh, for a small church just recently of people with health problems. We've had people with family problems. We've had people that have financial problems. And I'm not making light of those. But I'm just saying, if you sit and look at it and roll it over in your mind, that thing, if you nurse that thing, it's going to grow. Because you're looking at the wrong thing. Now look what else he says. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're going to pass away. But the things which are not seen are eternal. The Lord Jesus, listen to me, the Lord Jesus and His power, His grace, He said He wouldn't let you go through anything that you wouldn't be able to endure with His help. Now, if you try to do it on your own, you're going to struggle. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, if I try to do it on my own, I'm going to be weak. But if I allow Him, and I get my eyes off the circumstances and onto Him, that sounds easy, but not so easy to do, preacher. Well, try the first part and quit looking at your problems. And then take the second part and start looking up at him. When he said, when the Apostle Paul said, through Christ I can do anything, do you think that was true? If it's true, and it is, then we need to get our eyes on that promise. I want to give you one closing little story. You can choose to struggle and languish in the problems. And I'm not saying your problems are not legitimate. I'm not saying that for a minute. I'm not saying I wouldn't hurt if I was in your position. We all hurt. We established that, didn't we? We all hurt. But the difference is allowing those hurts to dominate your life and to knock you out so that you faint and you lose heart. That's what we're talking about. You can let those things cause you to faint and quit serving God, give up on church, give up on prayer, give up on Bible reading, give up on fellowshipping with God's people, give up on God's will for your life. You can give up on all that if you want to faint. Or you can choose the route that Paul did after he had been through all of those things that I can't even imagine. He said, we faint not. The old farmer had a well that was kind of open at the top and one night his old mule came stumbling along and stepped right in that well and fell in. About 15, 20 feet deep and the old well's down in there and he stays overnight and the farmer comes out the next morning and discovers the old mule in the well. Farmer tried to figure out a way to get the mule out but that was an impossible task. And so he thought about it a little while and he thought, you know, I've been wanting to fill up that old well anyway and the mule's getting kind of old. Now's a good time to fill up the well. He went and got his 
tractor and wagon and hauled a load of dirt up to the edge of the well and took his shovel and started shoveling it in the well. The old mule standing down there, and you know how sad they look anyway, don't you? You know, like kind of like some of you. And, uh, and the old mule is sitting there, standing there in the well, and that shovel, first shovel full of dirt hits him on the back, and he looks up and thinks, what is going on? Farmer throws another shovel full in, and he says, I'm sorry, old mule, I just don't know what else to do. And another shovel full, and another shovel full, and pretty soon the dirt's building up around the legs of the old mule, dirt on his back, and the old mule's feeling sorry for himself. Rightly so. The mule thought, I can't believe this is happening. I have plowed for that farmer. I have pulled wagons for that farmer. I've been faithful to that farmer, and he's covering me up with dirt. And he's standing there with tears rolling down his face, and dirt's building up around his legs. He kind of got an itch on one of his legs, and he pulled his leg loose out of the dirt. And then he couldn't get it back down in the dirt again, and his leg was up on top of the dirt. So he pulled his other leg up, front leg up, and had both of them on top of the dirt, and then he got an idea. So he pulled his hind legs up, he got covered up and so he's standing on top of the dirt and he got encouraged a little bit farmer still throwing dirt in there hitting him on the back dirt piled up that high on the back of the old mule and so the old mule shakes himself a little bit and shakes that dirt off well that covered up his hoofs again and so he stepped up one more time dirt came down on his back he'd shake it off and step up again and you know what happens sooner or later don't you the dirt finally got up to the top of the well and the mule stepped out. I'm not sure if he ever worked for the farmer again. But he learned a lesson you and I need to learn and that's shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm saying it's temporal. This too shall pass. There is a bright day coming. I don't know when. I just know it's coming. There's a resurrection coming and a new body. I don't know when. I just know it's coming. There's a new star rising in the sky. I don't know when, but it's coming. There is a heavenly home that waits us on the other side if you're born again. I don't know when we'll be there, but I know it's there. Get your eyes off the dirt and look up. Let's pray together. Father,